Greetings, sisters and brothers, and welcome to the fellowship of Rocky River Presbyterian Church in Rocky River, Ohio. I'd like to start our time together with a few verses from Psalm 45, proclaiming Jesus Christ as the divine King, worthy of all authority and power. Your divine throne is eternal and everlasting. Your royal scepter is a scepter of justice. You love, the righteous, you love the righteous and hate the wickedness. No wonder God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy more than all your companions. I'm Kathy Hartzell, an elder of Rocky River Presbyterian Church. I'm so glad and appreciative that you're sharing a part of your day for this fellowship as the power of God's Holy Spirit draws us together across distance and time. Please join me in approaching God in a spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we come together to worship and praise you, but too often our worship becomes too routine. Too often we offer lip service without offering our hearts. We humbly look to you to be transformed into a new creation of your design. Open our eyes to your call to show love by communicating with grace and speaking truth to the world around us. Soften our hearts and give us a deeper understanding of your mercy so that we might extend mercy. In our Lord Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and transformed. Praise be to God. Now, let's listen for the word of God in these readings from the Bible. First, from the New Testament the letter of James, chapter 1, verses 17 to 27. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we could become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourself of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away, immediately forget what they look like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to care for orf orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. And from Mark's Gospel, the familiar story teaching about rules, traditions, and intention of the heart. This you can find in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 8 and 14 through 23. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, 
they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they thoroughly wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live? according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands. And he said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called to the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. He said to them, then do you also fail to understand? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile, since it enters not the heart, but the stomach, and goes goes out into the sewer? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, it is what comes out of a person that defiles. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. So it's what's inside that counts. Now, have you ever been working on your computer and accidentally switched to the screen that shows the HTML code behind the page? It is a page filled with lines of words, symbols, and numbers. To most of us, it makes no sense. It is foreign language, but it has an important purpose. It is written to format and design the pages on our screens so the words and images display properly. The rules require great attention and are very detailed. Today, there's a high demand for skilled coders. These individuals have a deep understanding of the rules needed to bring about order of ca- from chaos on our many devices. As I reflected on the scriptures for today, the HTMT, see I can't even say it, the HTML codes, HTML codes came to mind. I thought the Pharisees of Jesus' time had taken the commandments of God and the teaching of the elders and created an extremely detailed code for the people of Israel to follow. The code had every activity of one's life scripted. The one specifically referred to in today's scripture had to do with the ceremonial cleansing before every meal. The Pharisees didn't call out Jesus and his followers for not following tradition simply because they were guilty of bad manners or for personal hygiene practices. In their minds, to dismiss this law was to be unclean in the sight of God. The man who ate with unclean hands was open to attacks from the demon Shibda and become liable to poverty and destruction. Unfortunately, the task was not simply washing one's hands. There was code inside the code 
The hands had to be washed with water held in special large stone jars so that the water itself was clean in a ceremonial way. The hands had to be held in specific positions, first fingertips up, then fingertips pointed down. And there were many more instructions to this practice, but I think you get the picture of how complicated and detailed it is. Perhaps the Pharisees saw the influence Jesus had on his followers and the people wanted him to keep the practice so others would find it valuable. But neither Jesus or James attempted to throw away all of the traditions and the commandments of God. Rather, Jesus openly questions the use of these rules and calls out the hypocrisy of keeping them in name only. I think Jesus used this opportunity to address the many concerns and questions the Gentiles and the Jewish community had about following the rituals and religious practices and traditions. In the New Testament, the issue of food and cleansing come up often and are addressed first by Jesus, also by Paul and James. So these concerns are not to be taken lightly. Jesus doesn't confront the Pharisees as an outsider. When he turns the table on their concerns, he does so as a deeply religious Jew who cites the prophetic tradition of Israel in reproving their selfish interests. He asserts their hearts are far from God as he quotes Isaiah, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. Having traditions, sacraments, and practices to honor God and to join together in community for good works that glorify God is important. But now, as then, we live in a diverse society and need to be aware of how we communicate and demonstrate the heart of our own religious traditions. Our challenge today is to recognize how we, like Pharisees, misinterpret what is important to God. In considering the heart of our faith, it is difficult to preach about our human inclination to the list of evil actions in verses 21 and 22. We are all susceptible to sin and are guilty of practicing one or more of the sins listed there. If we want to examine our hearts in the heart of our religion, we must be willing to explore honestly whether our attitude and our actions reveal genuine love for God and compassion for others. Christ's words remind us that the growth in our capacity to love is directly related to an increased awareness of the hidden intentions of our heart. I want to repeat that. The growth in our capacity to love is directly related to an increased awareness of the hidden intentions of our hearts. While Jesus dismisses the ritual, he calls great attention to the character and the intent of their lifestyle. James opens this up more with a vision of a faithful life. Living such a life means avoiding hypocrisy so that one may live more faithfully in relationship to God. We choose to live with ethical understanding and loving attitudes, which encourages our awareness of God and impacts our relationship with loved ones and strangers. James reminds us that every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above. God nurtures us, gives us gifts, and provides directions for our lives, often using human agency to do so. In his keen observation of human nature, 
James begins with the power of human speech, both to build up and destroy. A few years ago, while studying other philosophies and religious traditions, I read a Toltec wisdom book by Don Miguel Ruiz. It's titled The Four Agreements. The Toltec culture of, Me of Mexico ended a thousand plus years ago, but the universal message of their wisdom, which is right in step with scripture, lives on. The first and most important of the four agreements starts with be impeccable with your word. It sounds very simple, but it is very powerful. One's word is the gift directly from God. The word impeccable comes from the Latin word peccatus, which means sin. The im in impeccable means without. So put them together, impeccable means without sin. Ruiz teaches that being impeccable with one's word is the correct use of one's energy. It means to use one's energy in the direction of truth and love. Similarly, James connects the importance of how we relate to one another by how we use words. He knew that our words reveal something about our motivation, intention, belief, and emotional life. For example, anger is an emotion that can be destructive or can be a warning of some wrongdoing. Therefore, anger can be channeled in ways that lead to protest and improvement. We make the decision about its meaning in our lives. James knows this. He does not, in, he does not deny the importance or strength of anger. Rather, he encourages us to transform anger into a virtue. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. This is hard work, especially for those of us who are quick to judge, impatient with ourselves, and with others, and particularly when we are in disagreement or have already made up our minds. To resist such, such impatience requires discipline and cultivating the virtues of a discerning and welcoming spirit. James counsels us to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. What we do matters, and what comes out of our mouth makes a difference. Through thoughtful words and faithful activity, we create and recreate ourselves in trustworthy ways and help build worlds, worlds worthy of our trust. Actions add value to our words and give them life. I'm reminded of the Foundation of Hope in Pittsburgh. This is the foundation I worked for for my field education while at the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. The foundation runs the chaplain's office at the Allegheny County Jail, in which I was a chaplain intern. On the foundation website, you can find information about the PRIC movement, Positive Initiative to Reinforce Change. Their motto reflects much of what I'm speaking of today. Their motto is, our thoughts become our words, our words become our actions, our actions become our habits, our habits become our character, and our character becomes our destiny. These words are not new. They are attributed to a Chinese philosopher, Lao Tzu, born in 571 BCE. He called for the people of his time to watch your thoughts, words, actions, etc. And this philosophy has been repeated by the leaders of many cultures, such as Buddha and Gandhi, and even Margaret Thatcher. It seems to me 
to be a universal teaching which crosses over time, space, cultures, and religions. Jesus reinforces the first step of this process by focusing on the heart. Jesus uses the word heart three times in this scripture, and with each reference, we sense the importance of the human heart for our own religion, faith, and practices. Since the heart was thought to be the center of one's will and decision-making abilities, Christ urges us to consider our own hearts rather than our neighbor's dirty hands. Here, Jesus stresses that the thought which is born in the heart is the father of the deed. Jesus declares the whole ritual, ritual irrelevant and that uncleanness has nothing to do with what a person takes into their body, but everything to do with what comes out of their heart. So too, the Toltec wisdom echoes Jesus' teachings. Through the first agreement, be impeccable with your word, one can attain the kingdom of heaven. Today, our culture views decisions of the heart to be emotional and sometimes less effective than using our heads. This may be true when it comes to tasks like HTML coding or required details, steps, or instructions, but when it comes to being in relationship with God, we are encouraged to be a reflection of Jesus Christ's heart, a heart of compassion, justice, patience, and care, all the attributes of love, which is the nature, the character of God. We are by no means perfect. This God knows well. But as Paul tells us, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, if God saw fit to reconcile us ungodly as we are, shouldn't we work to do the same for each other? I am challenged to work on this daily, honestly, sometimes hourly, but the habit is well worth making. If you are living this way, please help others join you on this path. If this is a first time for you to consider this interpretation, it is never too late to start. Just remember, it's what's inside that counts. In this community of faith, in this church, we care for and pray for one another and for the world. Each week, we pray for church, for church members who are selected at random, simply to be the focus of our prayers. This week, our prayer focus includes Diana and Ron, Heidi, Melissa and Thomas, Beatrix, Hugo, and Owen. And we receive prayer requests, which I share with you now, that we may all pray for during the week. We pray for God's blessing of healing for Janice, Mary, Jim, Barbara, Michael, Joel, and Geraldine. And we pray for strength and safety for the health of our care workers. We also pray, pray in thanks for the flowers, which you see before me, that are in loving memory of Barb Migoy from her children. We pray for the people of Afghanistan and all those involved with helping in the, evac in the evacuation and to opening hearts and minds and arms to be welcoming communities and helpful in finding new homes. And we pray for those suffering from the COVID-19 virus and their families. So let us pray together. Dear God, help us to keep our eyes on you so that we can follow your promptings and respond to your call. Help us to see when another soul around us needs to be encouraged. Help us to be faithful to carry one another's burdens, remembering that we are all in this life together. And we thank you.
for your reminder that both in seasons of celebration and in seasons of brokenness, you are still with us. That your word says you are close to the brokenhearted and save the crushed in spirit. We thank you for our comforts abound through Jesus Christ and that our greatest source of help and strength comes from you. We thank you that though we face trouble and loss in this world, we can be assured you have overcome it all. And we ask for great miracles for this hurting world, for the comfort of your spirit to bring a covering of grace and healing to all those who have been broken. Through our own struggle and pain, help us to be your vessels to offer comfort and strength to others who are hurting. So Holy God, we ask all of this in the power of Jesus' name as we come together to speak the power of his words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to thank you for being a part of this worship experience. You're the reason we're here and to inspire and comfort and encourage you in your calling as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. If you have comments, reactions, or suggestions for us, please reach out. You can reach out by phone, text, email, or a brief note. We welcome your feedback. We also welcome your prayer requests. You can share with Pastor Fancher as much or as little detail as you are comfortable providing. And let him know if you want your prayer kept in confidence or shared in the broadcast. Your financial gifts and offerings continue to support our charitable mission outreach efforts and our ministry. Thank you. You can bring gifts to the church Drop them in the mail, use your bank's bill pay program, or donate through our website, which is www.riverpress.org. That's R-I-V-E-R-P-R-E-S, www.riverpress.org. You'll find new broadcasts posted on our Facebook page and YouTube channel every Saturday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. They are viewable anytime after that. In addition to these worship broadcasts, our church offers in-person worship services, and that will be in our sanctuary at 9.30 a.m. through the Labor Day weekend. Starting September 12th, worship returns to the 10.30 a.m. hour. At this time, masks are encouraged for everyone and required for anyone not fully vaccinated. There will also be a special congregational meeting following in-person worship on September 12th. This will be to elect new deacons and elders. Now friends, as we conclude our time together in worship, Accept Paul's words from Ephesians 4, verses 1 through, th 1 through 3. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And until we worship again together, may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit guide you, guard you, and bless you today and always. Amen. <laughs>